Good evening, Home Road Church of Christ. Welcome back. I'm glad that you could be with us this Sunday evening. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. That's the next section that is in our order as we go through and continue to walk through the book of Ephesians together. And today we're going to be simply looking at the fact that Jesus is the source of all unity. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this passage. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to there and we'll look at verses 11 through 22. But just a quick review, just in case you haven't been with us the last few weeks or, or maybe you just forgot where we've been. Kind of quick review, we've been talking about the fact that Paul said you as Christians are, have been made alive. You were used to be dead. Everyone who is without Christ is dead. But Christians are alive because of the power of Christ. It's the same power that has made us alive that rose Jesus from the dead. Uh, Christians are alive. They have that state. They're now alive. They used to be dead, but they're alive now because of grace. Grace is the thing that saves us. It's the only thing that's going to save us. And grace comes to us by way of our faith. And that's what Paul has talked about so far. Nothing you can do to obtain it. There's not anything you can do. It's given only as a gift by God that his grace is given to us. Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to obtain it has to be given by God in order for you to be made alive. When you are alive, like we talked about the last time we met here, then you become God's masterpiece. You become his workmanship. You are the best thing that he has ever thought about creating. Uh, just as a, the artists make their masterpiece the number one thing they're known for. And when that's very humbling to think about how much God, how much beauty God has created. I mean, he's created all this world. He created Niagara Falls. He created the deserts. He created all the gorgeous things in this world for us to look at. He created the forests, the mountains, space. He created planets. He created all these things. And he considers us, the saved humans, to be his masterpiece. And that is just an amazing, humbling thought. And so that's what we've been covering. It's what we've been looking at. Let's go ahead and look at verses 11 through 12 in this section that we're going to have tonight. Paul writes, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners of the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. So now he kind of is, he's addressing these Gentiles. He says, to those who were formerly Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised. He says, you guys used to be in a desperate place. I mean, let's face it. The Gentiles were in a, were in a desperate situation. Paul says, you were aliens and strangers. When it comes to your relationship with God, that's what you were. God didn't know you because you were strangers. They had no hope because they had sin in their life. And because they had no way to get to God. They were completely without God in every way. Their life, their sin, everything. They had complete separation. And because they were Gentiles, they had no way to access God. And so therefore they were spiritually dead because they were, they've all sinned. Just like the Jews, just like Christians. Every, everyone has sinned. But because they were Gentiles before Jesus Christ, they had no access to to the cure for sin. There was nothing they could do to obtain it. They didn't know about God. They didn't know about Jesus. And so therefore, they just didn't know how salvation could come. And so therefore, if you were a Gentile, you were in Satan's kingdom. There was the, the kingdom of the air, right? That's what uh, Paul has said about that. He, uh, Satan was the ruler of the kingdom of the air, where all the dead people are. Well, all the dead people spiritually belong in that realm. And we all belonged in that realm too until we were made alive. But uh, the Gentiles, they were dwelling in Satan's kingdom and there was no way for them to get out. There was nothing they could do. There was nothing they could do to get out of that state of being dead. There was no lifeline for them. Look at verse 13. But now in Jesus Christ, you who, who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What an amazing verse this is. He's saying to the Gentiles, you're no longer aliens. 
You're no longer strangers. You're no longer having that kind of relationship with God. You have a chance to come near. You have a chance to be brought near and have an intimate relationship with God, just as the Jews had. They had the opportunity to draw near to God. And how? This reconciliation between the two parties could only be accomplished by Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. That's the only way the Gentiles had a chance to come to God. Folks, I'm not a Jew. (laughs) I'm not a Jew, and so therefore I'm a Gentile. And as a Gentile, this is Paul speaking to me. He's saying, you had no access to God. There's absolutely no way you had any chance to be saved except for Jesus Christ came along. Jesus Christ came along and he sacrificed his life on the cross for you. And because of that, because of Jesus's loving sacrifice, you can now have an opportunity to be reconciled back to God. There was never any other way. Jesus' loving sacrifice is the only way anyone can draw near to God. Now that's including present day Jews. They're no longer a part of anything special. We're all in the same boat. We all need Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered on the cross for all sinners, which is every mankind. Every person, every person that's ever been We've all sinned except for Jesus Christ. And he fulfilled the law because so he became the perfect sacrifice. And as he, his blood drained out of his body, that blood, that sacrifice, that death allows me to have a relationship with God. His love for you is showed by the sacrifice. He didn't have to do that. He could have stayed of all in eternity. He didn't have to take on flesh and come to this world. He loves you so much. He left the Godhead, took on flesh. Took on flesh, became God in flesh. And was killed and destroyed. His body was mutilated for us. So that we could be reconciled. So that we could have a chance to come to God. And it is the only way. Anyone can come to God. Look at Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Paul writes, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh with law, with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. I want you to focus on that first part of verse 14. It said, Jesus himself, for he himself is our peace. I then find that a very interesting phrase, the way Paul wrote that. Jesus himself is our peace. Paul's not simply saying that he, that he mediated peace, that he brought peace, that he somehow that he was just this middleman between you and God and brought peace to you. No, it said Jesus is peace. He is the peace. You want to have peace in your life, you better have Jesus Christ. He is the peace. And so the, it's an interesting phrase there that Paul uses in the way he says that. If you want peace in your life, you must have Jesus Christ. And that's just, so many people try to find peace in other ways. They're trying to find it through their careers, trying to find it through money, personal status, social status, whatever it is. They're trying to find peace in so many other ways. But Jesus Christ is the answer for peace. And then he talks about this dividing wall of hostility. Now, what is this dividing wall? Metaphorically, we can all understand what, it we're, what it's talking about. Metaphorically, we understand we build walls up all the time between us and different people. We, those, those walls could be uh, built up because of race or because of different religious attitudes, different religious beliefs, or because of social status, because of um, money, 
so much, so many families have been destroyed because of people's greed, and they end up having hostile walls dividing them. So we all understand the metaphorical aspect of it. But in their particular world in that day, the dividing wall was physical. It, the dividing wall was an actual wall. See, in the temple at that time, there was this big dividing wall that separated the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women. The temple was built in such a way that there were certain levels. God, of course, was in the, the Holy of Holies in the very center, but you go out and only priests could enter. Then you go out there and only Jewish men could enter. Then you go out and only Jewish women could enter. Then you go out and then that's when all people could come, including Gentiles. But there was this big wall that was all the way around the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles could not pass that wall. Jewish women and men could go past that wall, but not a Gentile. And because of that, there was a huge separation in terms of the races right there. If you were Gentile, you were not allowed to go past that. That is a physical bar barrier and an actual wall that separated Jew and Gentile. So this is very literal that Paul is writing here. Because there was a literal dividing wall that split the races apart. Another little bit of irony here is the fact that Paul, when he was writing this letter, he was in prison. He was under house arrest, so to speak, because he had been falsely accused by the Jews of taking a Gentile into the temple. In other words, the Jews said, you're going to be in prison, you're waiting trial, you're going to be in prison because you took a Gentile and you took him beyond that wall. You took him into the place where only Jews were allowed. Now, you, Paul, are a Jew, but you weren't allowed to take a Gentile past that wall. And he was falsely accused of, doing, of breaking the law in that sense and smuggling in a Gentile into that area beyond the dividing wall. That's the reason he's actually in prison as he writes. And so he knows a lot about this dividing wall. He knows how important it is in that culture. And Paul is saying, you know, you can imprison me for that. You can put me in a false charge here. But guess what? The wall is gone. He's like, you know, even if, even if I did what I said you did, because it was a false charge, right? It was a false charge. But not even that false charge is really correct because Jesus has destroyed that wall. There is no more wall that should separate uh, Jews and Gentiles. Jesus has united them all. So even if the false charge, even if Paul had done that, Paul is saying it doesn't matter because the dividing wall of hostility is gone because of Jesus Christ. It's gone because of Jesus' sacrifice, because he spilled his blood. He took care of the, the Testament law. That's gone. Paul is saying... Jesus has united the races. He's brought Jews and Gentiles together. There's no longer a need to keep them separated. There's no longer a need to have the, the women separated from the men and the men separated from the Jewish men separated from the Gentile men and all this crazy. It's all over with. Paul is saying that is done because Jesus has united everyone. There's no more division. There's no more going to be a court of women, a court of men, a court of Jews, a court of Gentiles. That's all done. We're all humans in the sight of God. Folks, this is very important for you to understand. For all of us today, right now in the year 2022, all the things that divide us in this world, Jesus doesn't want that. Think for a second how powerful this teaching is, folks. Paul is saying because of Jesus, there shouldn't be any separation. Think about all the things that separate us today. America today is separated by, by poverty and rich. It's separated by races. We're separated by religion. We're separated, separated by political party. Do you realize there's even talk about civil war in America these days? Because the parties have gotten so angry with each other. I mean, it's just insane how divided we are. But because of Jesus, people are no longer needed to be separated. 
We're not separated by political, racial, economic, language barriers, geographical barriers, or whatever. People in China, we're, people in Japan, people in, in, in the Middle East, people in Europe, we're all together, even though we never met them, we're all one family because of Jesus Christ. His blood unites us. No matter where we are, no matter what issue you can think that divides you, Jesus, I've taken care of it. I've blown it out. I've, I've took care. The walls are gone. We can all be united under the one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. Folks, we have a congregation of 100 plus people here, and if we were to poll everybody, we'd find out we have all, everybody has different opinions on things. And those opinions can separate us. Those opinions, I may not agree with, with what anybody else thinks. If we had 100 people and we pulled them all, we'd all disagree on different things. But we call each other brother and sister because of one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. And that one thing is more important than any of the other stuff. And so, therefore, the dividing wall is gone. The source of the division that was the, the separation the source of what divided the Gentiles from the Jews was really the law. The reason that dividing wall existed was because they said, we don't want people who don't follow the law to be able to get any closer to God than this. You know, the Gentiles, they don't practice ceremonial washings. They don't practice the prayers three times a day. They don't follow any parts of the law. So therefore, they don't get to get close to have access to God. So we're going to make this wall. But the law is the reason why it existed. But guess what Paul is saying here? Since Jesus has fulfilled the law and died on the cross, he put that law to death. And so therefore, if the law does not exist, then there is no reason anymore to have separation. You know, maybe, maybe in the Old Testament law, that wall was there for a reason. That wall was there because these people chose not to follow the law. We're following law, so therefore we can have access. But all that, if that is the reason, Paul is saying that, is, that reason no longer exists. So the dividing wall is gone. Because Jesus put the law to death. It's over. Gentiles can now no longer be excluded because they didn't follow the law. The law is gone. They don't have to follow it. Neither do the Jews. Neither does anybody else. Us Christians today, we don't have to follow the law anymore. And thank goodness, that's almost, it is impossible to follow. And it's gone because of Jesus Christ. Only his work unifies. It was only Jesus and the work that he did here while he was on earth, while he was in flesh. It was the work that he did in those 33 years that allows us to be unified. It's Jesus and his work that has reconciled all the groups, all the different groups from all over the world. Think about all the political, geographical, national separations. Think of all the separations we have within our own nation. But all of that can be overcome. All of that can just go away. And we can all have unity if we just come under Jesus Christ. And so therefore, the church, because of the cross, is the place of unity. It's the place of belonging. It's the place of togetherness. When people come in off the street, they're not going to see politics. They're not going to see race. They're not going to see economic division. They're not going to see all these different things. They're just going to see a group of people who love each other and united under the, under the headship of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. The church says... Forget about all that stuff the world forgets about. When you come into the church, you come to a place where you belong, where you're going to be accepted, where you're going to have a family if you choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're going to get to join a place of peace and unity. The church should have a sign that says, there's no room for division here. Leave your politics at the door. Leave your... Uh, opinions to yourself leave your anger and hatred out there when you come to the church you come with peace 
and togetherness and unity and love for each other. And you want to support each other regardless of the different, different opinions. We're going to have different opinions. Even in my own family. You know, I have three boys, me, my wife, and my three boys. Even just in the five of us, we have different opinions. No one is going to be able to see eye to eye on everything. But we can see eye to eye in Jesus Christ. And when we let that be our focus, there is no division. Let's look at verse 17 through 18. Paul finishes up, he says, He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Jesus preached peace to those who needed it. The Gentiles lived in a situation where they needed peace, right? They were dead, they lived in the kingdom, they needed rescue, they lived in the kingdom of Satan. Jesus brought the gospel of peace to those who were in conflict. He didn't just bring it to the Jews. He brought it to the, people, the, the enemies of the Jews. He brought it to Gentiles. Jesus says, I'm bringing the gospel to everyone, even the enemies. You have a chance to be reconciled to God, to be part of the family of God. And he's bringing that gospel to anyone. That same gospel that was preached to the Jews is the same gospel that is preached to the Gentiles. It's the same gospel for all, and it's the same good news that Jesus brings to you today. You have a chance. You have the same chance today to get right with God that the Jews had 4,000 years ago. Everyone has equal access to the Lord, and to be reunited with God because of Jesus Christ. Look at the uh, 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So now Paul gives us this beautiful picture of unity. When you look at this building, when you drive by and see the building here, you see, uh, you see one building. You don't see the individual bricks. You don't notice this brick looks different than that brick or this brick has a scratch. You just see the building. And that is how Paul is describing the church. He says, you are all individual bricks, but you're no longer strangers or foreigners. You no longer stand out. Now you are part of a building. You're all being a part of this growing building that's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Everything that you read about, the Old Testament, the prophets, all those stuff, they were all laying a foundation for Jesus, who's the chief cornerstone. In other words, the chief cornerstone is that middle one way up high that, that everything is built on. He's the head of it. And without it, the whole building would fall apart. Jesus is that chief cornerstone of the building. And every time someone comes and, and let, believes in Christ, he's added to the building. There's another brick in the building. This building is constantly growing. And it's a beautiful and glorious building. It is where the Spirit of God dwells. The Spirit of God used to dwell in the temple, but now it's where the church is. Now it's when the Spirit of God resides in each one of us as we are part of the church. Nothing is more sacred and divine than being a part of the church because that's where we obtain the Spirit. And anyone can be a part of it. Anyone, regardless of race, status, educational level, whatever it is, we can all be a part of this building. And that is the lesson for you this evening. I hope it has been encouraging for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for his loving sacrifice that allows us to reconcile back to you. And as we continue to sin in this life, we don't want to do what we do, but we do sin. 
and we're, we apologize and we ask for forgiveness in that. But we know we have forgiveness because the blood of Christ continually washes us white as snow. And thank you for that wonderful gift. We can't ask, we, we couldn't do anything to obtain it. It was a gift from Jesus and we give you the praise and the glory for that plan. We thank you that anyone can come to Jesus and we ask truly that we have unity. And that when we come to the church, that when, when we enter into the church, that we will truly be people of peace and love and support for one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, Holmes Road. See you soon. Bye-bye.